problem at all, sir. Now it's uh, okay. Now we have one seventy-eight okay. participants. Shall we begin, sir? Yes. Sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Dear all, a very good morning to you. I have been blessed to stand before you and welcome you all to our international webinar. This is an auspicious and at the same time a very complicated situation for us. Our world is suffering under the compromising grip of COVID-19 pandemic which has dis uh, disrupted our uh, daily life and status quo. Before I welcome you all, I would like to pray for those who have lost their lives during their battle against COVID-19 and who are still battling against this. Let us take this moment to thank God for keeping us safe amidst of this pandemic and for making this webinar a reality. Marian, for the last 24 years, has shown unparalleled excellence in the field of academics. The growth of Marian can be only be calculated on astronomical numbers. With hard work, goal-oriented ambition, and grace from God, we have reached so far. The Department of Communication and Media Studies is the youngest and one of the most creative departments of Marian. Within a short span of time, we have molded students who are excelling in the field of communication and media studies. The MCMS program is tailored to suit the aptitude of each student based on their aspirations. This webinar is being conducted amidst of several limitations. Under the guardian wings of Median, the Department of Communication and Media Studies is committed to make this lockdown an informative and productive one. Therefore, I would like to welcome our Honorable Principal, Reverend Dr. Roy Abraham P., and our manager, Father James Kolimala, to our international web, uh, media webinar. Ever since beginning of the conceptualization of this uh, international webinar, they were on board and rendered all kinds of support. We have three main speakers who are here to enlighten us on the importance of responsible journalism during the, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sure that all of us will leave this webinar with abundant knowledge and wisdom. Therefore, I would like to welcome Ms. Vinita Nair, who is settled in Edison, New Jersey, USA. She is a journalist, news anchor, speech and debate coach. He is also an architect of who has shaped the future of many careers. Welcome. Ms. Gidanjali Kurian is settled uh, in Sydney, Australia. She is a reporter, writer and documentary producer. Her immense knowledge in the field of journalism has made her a suitable speaker for our webinar. Welcome. Mr. B. Srijan is a household name in Kerala. He is an ocean of knowledge and rich with practical journalistic experience. He is currently the Metro Editor of Times of India, Truvandrum. His humility and wisdom will always be an example for students to follow. Welcome, sir. Our very young and, young and vibrant director, Professor M. Vijaykumar, sir, is the moderator of this webinar. He has abundant experience in the teaching and practical field of journalism. His enthusiasm is a direct resultant in the fulfillment of this webinar. Welcome, sir. Dr. Michael Putundra is a man of impeccable character and embodiment of academic excellence. He is one of the strong pillars of our department. He is a man who finds immense joy in imparting and sharing his wisdom to his students and colleagues. Welcome, sir. Our department is rich with vibrance and enthusiasm emitted from the panel of young faculty members. 
they have been working tirelessly for helping the students even during this pandemic i would like to welcome mr vishnu ms elsina joseph mr joby nj and mr ashwin kevin nambudri to this international webinar even though it's a welcome address i would like to thank professor samson thomas dean extern affairs marine international institute of management kutikanam for providing this providing the technical support to conduct this webinar thank you and welcome sir we have faculty members from other departments who are attending this webinar they have always shown support and solidarity for our department and and its endeavors all heartedly therefore i am welcoming each and every one of you to this program finally you the delegates are the real beneficiaries and success determinants of this webinar along with our former current and future students you also have delegates from other colleges universities organizations states and nations who have joined us for this international media webinar i would like to welcome you all with immense gratitude from the bottom of my heart to this webinar may god bless you may god bless us all abundantly with good health and future and keep us away from all atrocities of the world you can type your questions in the chat box and the selected questions will be answered by the panel members a feedback form will be shared with you in between the program and you will get the certificate only if you fill the feedback form now i invite professor m vijay kumar to moderate the session thank you thank you father sobhi it's uh, uh it's with immense pleasure that i'm addressing the audience scattered everywhere on the globe you know i'm talking to you from a place called bandram the new name is tiruvananthapuram tiruvananthapuram is the city of uh, sri padmanabha he is resting on ananta the serpent okay but in trivandrum it is a triple lockdown i cannot move out from my house nobody can walk out from their house and the police are monitoring the movements of every citizen in trivandrum trivandrum has reported the largest number of covid patients in the last uh, last few days and the world statistics tells that there are 1 crore 42 lakh and 80589 covid cases in the world and in india it is more than 10 lakhs nearly 11 lakhs and in kerala Uh, nearly 12 lakh people sorry 12000 people are affected and in kerala there were 40 deaths so far and the recovery rate fortunately is more than 60% so why we have started this program is that the covid 19 pandemic has created many fa- fake news Bunny, can you hear me? We can hear. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No problem. Okay, I'm not appearing on the screen. <laughs> That's why I'm okay. No, sir. You, we can see you also. No issue. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, the problem with the with the press or the social media is that they are spreading fake news many times in the past. i am the only person in my apartment subscribing to three newspapers nobody else in my apartment is subscribing to newspaper they were subscribing to the newspapers before the onset of covid it happens with many other uh, locations here 
why they are not subscribing to a newspaper is why they are subscribe not subscribing to a newspaper is and several public leaders in Tamil some public leaders in Kerala, several public leaders, political leaders in India are also spreading fake news. That this COVID pandemic is a creation of somebody else. So this is why we are select we have we have selected this topic. Because now there are many stories from Vinita's place, from Gitanjali's place, that the dead bodies are being piled up in several cities in Italy, in Spain, in US, and in many other cities. I, I, I can't believe these stories. I refuse to believe these stories because I know it will never happen in a country like. America in a country like Spain or Italy. But as fake news, the fake news has spread all over India, all over the world, that the pandemic has created several other concocted stories. This precisely is the reason why we have wanted to address this issue. And we want to know what is happening in the Western world. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that Vinita Nair is with us today. Fortunately, she is from my, my place to Andrew. Okay. Uh, she has been living uh, in Edison, New Jersey for the last 20 years. She settled there. She is a U.S. citizen. There. She was working with uh, a, 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 a TV. Uh, broadcasting Malayalam programs in New Jersey. And briefly, she also did some work for various other channels. She is very active now. She is a trainer also for public speaking. Uh, she has also reported for several, several news channels. And she is very, very current in reporting several matters from US to various other countries, including India. I would like to warmly welcome Vinita Nair to this program and I request you to begin your presentation of what is happening. We are eager to know what is happening. I don't know whether dead bodies are piled up in your, in your place, but that is, that is a news we, we have heard from several, even from several newspapers, not only from the social media, but from several newspapers that dead bodies are piling up in several American cities. Over to Vinita Bhai. Thank you so much, Vijay Kumar, sir, for your kind introduction. Thanks to Father Sobi. I just want to make sure everybody can see and hear me well. Yes, yes, it's, it's clear and we yes. can see you. Thank you so much. Like Vijay Kumar sir said, I live in Edison. It's a township in central New Jersey. COVID-19 pandemic, again, as Father Sobi said, is been absolutely horrible for most people in most countries. But luckily I have something good to begin with. As you may know, the state of New Jersey, in particularly New York City, and New, Jer uh, uh, New York State, New Jersey and New York City were hot spots of the novel coronavirus just a couple of months ago. But if you ask me the current scenario, there is a dramatic decline in the number of new cases, the number of new hospitalizations, the people who are being discharged from the hospital, the people who are currently on ventilators or on critical care in the East Coast, the numbers have significantly reduced. So though the overall situation is still extremely critical, I have at least some good news to tell all of you from my part of the world. Right now in the US in states like Texas and Florida, COVID-19 is surging. 
So is the United States still struggling with COVID-19? The answer is yes. This has been an absolutely terrible situation for more than 135,000 people have lost their precious lives. Let me take a very quick look at some of the reasons for what happened in this country. Very briefly, some key points only, because this is such a long topic in itself, but um, I, I want to make it brief. I would, in a two words, come to my mind when I think about the scale of the pandemic in this country. Initial failures. The president was in denial. The federal government and the state government could not foresee a situation like this. See, United States is home to millions from all around the world. If you take New York City, of course, the city has a very huge workforce, the number of people working there, living there, the rapid transit system that they have, a lot of people are on to conduct their daily lives. Millions of tourists, visitors coming from other countries just to see New York City. So the government, the administrators failed to foresee that the virus carriers from other countries can land in this country on a massive scale. Another reason, the medical institutions were utterly unprepared for this. Whether it's just testing kits or personal protective equipment, they were just not ready to face a pandemic. Then the peculiarities of uh, the system, what I mean is, it's it just awesome that uh, the United States citizens, they enjoy the rights and liberties, it's a free country. But at the same time, I'll just give you one example how this might have backfired. South Korea could trace, um, uh, you know, they could, they, they, they did rapid testing and tracing using GPS, you know, the tracking device. But such a thing is not really easy to get going in the US. You know, people will not be so comfortable uh, with the monitoring system and sharing their information, especially with the government agencies. So all of these factors have contributed uh, to uh, this immense scale of uh, COVID-19. But fortunately, because of some measures in place, things have definitely uh, come down um, in certain states. Certain states are surging. I hope with the proper measures in place, Let's hope that all of the US can come out of the situation sooner than later. Now, let me get into the pandemic coverage by mainstream US media. Where did this virus come from in the beginning? The virus originated in a country where the press is not free. Let's answer that fact. The Chinese government, as usual, um, you know, their routine is to crush any form of dissent. I know that foreign media uh, outlets were expelled from the country. So the information that came out from China, the state control, I mean, we can choose to believe it or not, it's completely up to us. But the US, at least the press is free and freedom of the press is constitutional. So um, this is a question to uh, Srijan and uh, uh, whoever is representing, um, uh, you know, media from India. I have uh, read at least two reports saying in some Indian states, definitely not Kerala, journalists were penalized for exposing the, uh, the shortcomings of the authorities, whether it is government or someone reports this hospital doesn't have enough supplies. Uh, they were attacked, not physically, but, you know, they had some sort of a resistance from the authorities. You know, I would like you to clarify on that. I have a few links here to discuss if you want to. Um, such a situation is definitely not here. Um, I don't know if there are any exception out there, but in general, uh, we are free to report, to say what we want from the angle of the press. Um, what has been the approach of mainstream US media towards the pandemic? Except for Fox News and a few uh, media groups, most left-leaning media, they've been extremely critical of the Trump administration. And that just didn't start with COVID coverage. They have always been, uh, always taken very strong position against the current administration and it really followed. But one thing is, 
the president, whether it's the president or the state governors or the mayors um, or health officials, once the virus started surging, uh, particularly in New York and um, some of the other states, they did press briefings regularly. Almost every day, which still continues in the case of uh, New York and New Jersey governors. So these government officials spoke to the public through press conference on a very regular basis. I still remember when the health minister of Kerala, uh, she, when she started doing press meets, I think she was criticized for having some sort of mania or something in the big, but I think currently the chief minister is giving a um, direct information to the people uh, through press conferences. In my opinion, press meets are absolutely needed for a healthy uh, democratic process. In India, um, I don't see prime minister talking directly to the people, not taking questions from the press. And when I was talking to my friend Srijan about that um, a while ago, he told me that some chief ministers too follow that practice. See, this is an opportunity for the people to get straight answers from the president or prime minister, whoever. So a journalist, uh, you know, maybe you are not very fond of what media says, okay? But you can directly listen to this official and get the information straight and so there's no uh, confusions there. And I am definitely in favor of that. And I have done a small research and I found out that the press meets uh, that were done by New York governor and New Jersey government did help the people to understand the gravity of the situation. And at least it's some, at least for, for some people, you know, they really recognize the seriousness of it earlier and they might have taken adequate recommendations, me included. Okay, I absolutely did that. Now, um, let me come to uh, Vijay Kumar, uh, sir, ask a question in the beginning. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, <laughs> um, in fact, someone asked me too, whether, you know, dead bodies are, I, I'm coming to that. Just before that, um, this is about the coverage of both print and visual media in Kerala, um, the coverage of the US COVID situation in particular. Again, when I was talking to Sridhar, because I had some doubts about it, and uh, I had a conversation with him early on. I asked him, what is the process that you follow while covering international news? He said that, of course, we have content sharing agreement with the Associated Press and Reuters. So we get the information directly from them. And, uh, you know, that, that's that been the standard. Um, but um, I clearly remember, and unfortunately, I do not have the links because this happened in April, May. Um, some reports particularly in Malayalam, newspapers and television channels lacked a significant fact-checking process. Uh, from the US, if you're talking about Malayalam reports, uh, uh, maybe you've heard of senior journalist Anupama Venkade, she used to report um, regularly and uh, it was absolutely done professionally and there were a few people like her who did that from the US to the media groups in India or Kerala. At the same time, um, let me just uh, give you one example of what I'm getting at here. Just a few days ago, in Malayalam Online, I see a report it's written by somebody over here. But um, this has come, appeared in uh, Manorama Online. New York lame, New Jersey lame, Jenangale, Tabada Bodhi Akiya COVID. Ipo, Matta Samstanangaleki, Anganiana, the other Tarangana, Adila. Okay, so. I consider this language really inappropriate. <laughs> it's an exaggeration. I don't know what it is. I leave uh, to Angie and Sridhar and Vikas to comment further on it. So I have seen many reports written in such language and uh, such illusions. I would say it is unprofessional. And what does that mean, actually? You have to ask the person who wrote it, correct? And in one television channel, at least, this was during the prime time newscast. Now the anchor is asking a question to the to one person who was just randomly chosen from somewhere. I am absolutely encouraging citizen journalism. Okay, I, I do believe that we do have to get uh, reports from normal citizens, and you know it's not necessary that someone is a minister or you know some celebrity to participate in a newspaper. I completely agree. At the same time, 
this person from new york uh, i clearly remember uh, saying that i any adetan endur is i mean he did not receive a, part, a, a certain item that he was looking for but the way he said nothing is available here <laughs> you know yeah then the anchor had some follow up questions and this person failed to give any adequate reply probably i, I 100% believe that probably this person did not get something yes there were a lot of shortage in fact i was looking for some i didn't get it too but that doesn't mean nothing is available anywhere and you know people are panicking it's just not the right way see if you are posting something on your facebook page or that is i think that's so social media you can say anything and write anything but i am specifically talking about mainstream media outlets and some of the report they have come there i think when you consider that aspect i think more responsibility is needed and that's my personal opinion um i want to take one example new york times everybody is familiar it's a very popular magazine media group politically they are left leaning okay they do have a, a, a political english so regardless of that their reports most of them the the fact checking process is credible you know when they are reporting about a hospital situation whether there is a ventilator shortage or anything they are going to the credible sources checking they are quoting the hospital who they talk to so that report makes sense probably this hospital had a terrible situation where there are not enough ventilators probably ventilators were not functioning but they're quoting and telling this not generalizing it but giving specific information which would make in good sense okay all right okay on particular occasion such a thing happen um, but you know i am not making a comparison here is it really easy for media outlets in india kerala to have such contacts in new york city maybe not but let me give you one clue there are a lot of medical professionals who are keralites working in the united states whether it is doctors nurse practitioners uh, respiratory therapists radiologists pharmacists so many of them and i have personally talked to many many of some of them are my friends some of them they're not um in this field about what exactly has been happening in of course in some hospital there was an overwhelming situation and i may have not, not seen or they have not seen any that body is on the streets with <laughs> as some tabloid report but yes they were overwhelmed especially in some hospitals some hospitals were fully equipped they did not have that sort of a challenge when people came in large numbers so so, so these are you know you cannot generalize it. that's my point and if you are saying something uh, with a uh, uh, seriousness and i would like that to come after checking with a credible source um again when i talk about the language that is being used or the exaggeration that we see um, in uh, prime time chat shows or news or whatever one argument is that this is what the people want this is also one question that i am uh, giving and i want an answer on this from everyone else who's been speaking after me this is because people like sensationalism people want this that's why we be, because uh, uh, media all over the globe is struggling right now because of the pandemic and it, definitely from what i know it's a bad situation in kerala a lot of layoffs happening it's struggling there it's a real struggle for my fraternity but so the, to maintain or increase readership or viewership they're doing some of them we don't have a choice but to do it i don't know how far this is true but one thing i'm sure even if i mean even in a situation where there was no pandemic and things were doing okay sensationalism was there even then is it not so it's not something that popped up recently along with the pandemic uh i think vijay kumar sir mentioned earlier about newspapers so this is one sad fact which a uh, mm -hmm. question again from me um i have heard a lot of people have stopped subscribing to newspapers of magazine i don't understand i want to know what media is doing uh, to give a clear understanding about the nature of this virus i subscribe time magazine here okay suppose the male man or woman she is a virus carrier or she is catching there is a of course there is a risk of this virus coming to this particular magazine so what do you do but it's not going to last forever it in 24 hours even if there is something on it's off so i just take it keep it on one side i haven't stopped anything 
I mean, it, I don't know why. Why is there such a, 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 a panic or such fear? If if media can project the right reason, you know, right information, uh, more, more and more. I'm I'm sure they have been information. I'm not uh, criticizing anyone. I'm not saying no one has said anything about uh, how this uh, virus, the nature of the virus, or informative reports might be there. But how often and why is this thing keep happening? We have to think uh, again. Srijan, he told me uh, that in Chennai, for a particular newspaper, uh, came down. You know, subscribers came from uh, forty thousand to four thousand, or some shocking numbers. He was saying. So this is all very sad. As media people, I think we can take a collective responsibility, whether it is the U.S. U.S. also, the people are panicking, are doing all sorts of things, but. Um, we have to make a change. This is not just about some people dying. This is absolutely affecting the livelihood of others. So it's important to know how this virus spreads and who is at risk and who is not, how far we can go. What are some of the precautions that we can take as an individual and the information that we can pass on to others? Um, well, um, these are some of the things I wanted to share. I hope I didn't miss anything but certain things um, of course, an elaborate <laughs> analysis needed. <laughs> thank so, you, thank you, Nilita. We will yeah. come back to you. Uh, okay. Because you know, people may have some questions to ask you. So we'll come back to you. But in the meanwhile, yes. now, uh, when uh, you talked about the misreporting of uh, uh, information from the US to the Indian media, you know, there's a phenomenon called you know, in the television news. Uh, channels, what happened is they have reporters everywhere on the globe. <laughs> I so thought that these people, uh, these people, uh -huh. uh, these people, I thought that these people are very trained people, they are journalists. Mm. But later I understood that these people are not journalists, they are working somewhere else in, the, in companies or in some government offices. They have no information whatsoever of what is happening in the United States or in, the, in Spain, or in Italy. These people are trying to impress the audience that this is what is happening in our country. But it is not the truth. Truth is far away from that. So I urged all the television channels in Kerala to desist from making any talk Dick and Harry as their reporter. This is what is happening. They are not conveying the true information, but some information gathered from some other sources. Okay. Uh, that precisely is the one thing that you have pointed out. Okay. We will come back to you. But in the meantime, I want to go to Gidanjali. Gidanjali Kurian is a TV producer. TV, she has uh, directed many TV programs. Uh, she's very active for the last uh, many years. Uh, she was uh, some time in uh, the United States. She was in Canada for some time. Uh, and uh, now she is settled in Sydney, Australia. I know that their uh, prime minister was TV when Australia was burning. I think now the uh, prime minister is back when the COVID pandemic was there in Australia. So, Gidanjali, over to you, uh, my take on Australia, okay? Thank you very much, uh, Vijay Kumar, sir. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think it was uh, uh, 33 years ago that we last spoke, so it was really surprising to have you reach out to me um, <laughs> across the globe out of the blue uh, and inviting me to join this um, uh, I also want to thank uh, Father Sobi for uh, making all the arrangements um, um, along with his team um, um, to get this um, whole event together and going. Um, and also to clarify, um, Vijay Kumar sir, I have not lived in the US, it's just New Zealand and Australia, even though I have traveled to the US um, on visits. Um, but um, moving on from there, um, before I actually um, talk about the uh, reporting of COVID in um, Australian media, I think I would like to actually um, set some context because I think context is very important. It's very, um, 
it's often easy for people to say, um, you know, reporting in India is very responsible, but the Western media, the Western media, I use uh, inverted quotes, um, is uh, extremely re uh, responsible in how they report whatever crisis we're talking about at that point of time or anything um, at any point really. So I would like to set some context to give you um, some sense of what Australian media is um, about. Now, I want to start uh, with a recent event. Um, on 5th June 2019, um, the Australian Federal Police conducted a raid of the offices of the um, Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Now, um, ABC is Australia's national broadcaster, funded by uh, federal grants and yet quite independent of any um, government authority. Now, the raids were conducted uh, at the instigation of the federal government, uh, the Home and uh, Defence uh, Departments in particular, because of a story reported by the ABC regarding alleged war crimes in Afghanistan. Now, the search warrant had been issued to allow the police to enter without notice and to add, copy, delete or alter any files they found on computers within the ABC with regard to this story. The previous day, the AFP had raided the home of a news corp journalist, Anika Smethurst, um, going through everything in her home from computers to her phone, to her cupboards, to anything and everything that they could find in her house. Um, that raid was with regard to a story that she had published back in 2018 on alleged plans to allow greater surveillance of um, Australian citizens. Now, she had revealed uh, top secret emails between the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs and the Secretary of the Department of Defence discussing a plan to allow the cyber spy agency to snoop on Australian citizens. Now, the AFP confirmed at the time that the raid was not only to uncover her source, but to potentially bring criminal charges against um, Anika and uh, the News Corp. Now, the media and public outcry following both those raids on you know, the 4th and 5th of June um, back in 2019 was instant and quite extraordinary. Now, all media across affiliations and political lines had banded together and on 21st of October, 2019, Every daily in Australia carried out a blacked out front page. Now, most of the um, uh, larger media outlets then formed a coalition which they call the Right to Know Coalition, demanding that journalists be given access to sensitive government documents when public interest demanded its release. The Right to Know Coalition also asked for the ability to contest any search warrant of a journalist or news entity while search warrant is under request, reforming of the Whistleblower Protection Act, new limitations on which um, documents may be classified as secret, changes in freedom of information, exemption from national security laws enacted over the period of um, seven years. There had been quite considerable um, changes that had come through. And also they asked for reforms of um, the defamation laws. What makes this joint protest extraordinary and the reason I'm talking to you about it is the nature of the Australian media. Over 75% of Australian media is under the ownership of Rupert Murdoch um, and uh, his, uh, the group that's called uh, News Corp here uh, that represents all the conservative rigor and power uh, political power that we know everywhere is typical of the Rupert Murdoch global empire. Much of the remaining media was previously held by the centrist um, Fairfax family. In fact, um, they've owned the um, quite considerable control of the media since the 1800s. Um, but as things go these days, uh, in 2018, Fairfax announced its merger with Nine West Media, um, Nine West shareholders taking the majority of the holdings while the Fairfax family retained just 49%. Now this sent shockwaves um, through the Fairfax um, uh, uh, media family and uh, journalists were immediately ready, many of them were immediately ready to resign because they feared um, that the Nine West media would bring um, new, um, you know, political 
leanings and affiliations and therefore impact on um, their, their reporting. Um, and the principal reason for this is the fact that the Nine West Media Chairman is Peter Costello, who is the former long-standing treasurer of the conservative right-wing Liberal Party. Um, uh, when, when I say Liberal Party, in Australia we have two major parties, the Liberal Party and the Labour Party. The Liberal Party, despite their name, is the conservative right-wing party and the current ruling party here. Now, many journalists feared the shift of editorial control. However, Nine West Media is assurance that they would not interfere in any uh, of the editorial narrative is what kept most of them um, staying. The only other prominent voice is that of the Guardian Australia, which is part of the UK based Guardian group, which most of you probably know and follows its left leaning footsteps. For Australians, this means that 75% of our media is conservatively inclined. And when I say inclined, that is an understatement. However, the Fairfax group with multiple daily editions across each city, as well as the only national business daily, uh, the Australian Financial Review, have been able to bring some balance to the national reporting and the narrative. Uh, the Guardian has valiantly sort of fought on in the left uh, with its continuing focus on social and human rights issues, albeit not without its own blind spots that make um, some of its policy and social commentary and narratives less considered and reasoned than they might be. But none of this is new territory to, or unfamiliar to any of you because um, a similar picture uh, is uh, clear in your own um, sort of context as well, whether it's in India or Europe or US or Middle East or wherever you might be. The fourth estate from back when Edmund Burke first coined the phrase, albeit at the time as a term of abuse and mockery, um, was meant to represent, was always meant to represent the people or the public interest, while the national interest is represented by governments and business. While public and national interests would you think be same or similar, we all know that that's not often the case. As in the case of the raids of, on the ABC that I talked, to, uh, I talked about earlier, the raids were carried out by the government in national security interest. But the stories were published in the first place by ABC and, and um, the News Corp journalists um, because they believed that it was in the public interest to know. But the lines are actually not so clear anymore because public interest has been overtaken everywhere in Australia, in India, in Europe, in the US, in Asia, and everywhere by political interests. The idea of a neutral or even centrist media is actually a fallacy. Media is controlled by political interests and corporate houses, a nexus that is common across the globe. They don't just own it passively, they control the narrative actively. We all start out with the noble idea of neutrality and state, uh, straightforward, objective, uneditorialized reporting. We do it for a while until we discover the heady power of political clout, the power of dictating the outcomes of democracy, of influencing a presidency, or in the case of India or Australia, influencing the prime ministership or the parliament. And that power is quite heady. And the media have succumbed everywhere to some level. It governs editorial policy, it governs reporting, it governs opinion. That editorial policy is carefully crafted by owners and whatever political side they espouse at that given time. And um, it is strictly enforced. At least that is my observation over all these years. So this very idea of responsible journalism is actually quite a tricky one. You as a reader have to work to form an intelligent and informed view those who do not want to, or those who do not, are preyed on by the likes of Fox News and News Corp. Most people grab headlines or clickbait, pushed through social media that is in constant flux, continuously devoured and is now the guiding light for people um, um, which they read and accept. Anchors are biased, panels and questions are loaded, audiences are divided along political lines, uh, dividing a nation so that it's rarely is there a time when a nation is actually working together. Yet this same media often steps up to the plate with immense responsibility and social consciousness. You cannot um, uh, you know, you have to accept that they do very, very often, supporting people in their resistance against oppression, in their cry for freedom, in 
cry for inclusion. Um, most recently, we've had the Black Lives Matter movement. We've had the Me Too movement. We've had the um, uh, the uh, citizens uh, uh, resistance in Hong Kong. In all of these, media has played a very strong role in bringing um, the importance of those movements um, to public notice. All of that preface then brings me to Australia's COVID reporting um, during the pandemic. Because once again, something extraordinary happened that for the last 20 weeks or so, suspended all divisions. We actually came into the pandemic as uh, Vijay Kumar sir um, has referred to after a devastating bushfire season uh, that had destroyed the Eastern states. 46 million hectares of forest was destroyed with pretty much all the flora and fauna in it. 3,500 homes were lost. 34 people lost their lives. Many were injured. 26% um, of our businesses were affected. The loss was to the tune of, I think, about 2.9 billion US dollars. And the prime minister at that time chose to go on holidays. And he chose to continue there until he was excoriated by the media and had to return. But his return and the visits and the actions that he took following that brought him no forgiveness or fans, neither in the public nor in the media. So when the pandemic hit, he was already under pressure, but his leadership during the pandemic could not have been more different if you could imagine it, as, as was the response um, um, of the media to that leadership. When the pandemic struck and it became apparent that Australia too was in the crosshairs, the prime minister and the federal government made the decision that this was a time for a united front. Now the ruling liberal coalition, as I mentioned, uh, when we say liberal coalition, the liberal party is actually our right wing conservative party. Um, they have formed a coalition with the national, uh, national party, also a right wing um, uh, party um, to form the, um, you know, the government at the moment. Uh, so the ruling liberal, uh, liberal coalition, the opposition, all parties across the spectrum came together in a show of absolute national unity in public interest. A national cabinet was formed on 13th of March, which included the prime minister and the premiers and chief ministers of all our states and national um, territories. The chief medical officer uh, was the principal advisors, as were the chief medical officers and deputies for each of the states. Um, and they, of course, focused on their localized response. We had, a, we had health advisors who were being listened to. We have a very strong public health care system. So that's, um, we're starting um, with an advantage there. Uh, we had an opposition who chose to join the national effort with all the political arguments completely suspended. The Reserve Bank and the bank leaders stepped forward to be supportive. Uh, union leaders chose to help where they could. And we had the people of Australia come together to listen to these decisions and as far as possible, comply to the restrictions and keep to the lockdown, despite the deep distress and discomfort. The media made a conscious decision to work as one with this national effort. All politics were thrown aside to report the most important information that the citizens need as it unfolded. Daily press briefings by premiers, weekly sometimes, more often there were briefings from the prime minister alongside chief medical officers and ministers of health. Um, and those updates became, um, as uh, Vinnie was talking to um, about the states in the US, those updates became uh, you know, the key information source for media and therefore for the public. All major dailies opened their online COVID pages for everyone to read because most of them are otherwise um, subscription based. Um, both global and national stories were featured. The stories were spread across health, economics, um, and community themes. All government alerts were immediately um, sort of pushed through. And yet, if you're then thinking, wow, this, 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 is, this sounds like a perfect scene. Um, and yet in many ways, it was not different from anywhere else. The volume and tone initially was one of absolute panic and danger and crisis um, to the point that after a few, few days, a lot of people I talked to said, I'm not turning on the TV. I'm not reading the headlines. I just can't, it's just too upsetting. 
speculation on the origin of the virus, conspiracy theories around its spread occasionally also found space. And like everywhere else, often if you read the headlines or turn on the news, uh, the stories were always about the most horrific imminent danger. If the chief medical officer for once, I watched a, a, a Q&A show, which is one of my favorite shows and the, um, you know, the panel, uh, the um, panel hosts are usually really credible journalists, some whom I hold in high esteem, as was one of these people. Um, on that show, the chief medical officer um, responded positively to a question from the audience, pointing out quite reasonably that Australia's response, which arguably has been until recently at least uh, among the best in the world, um, uh, you know, he essentially said, look, not to worry, we have been on top of this, we're doing a really good job, we're taking all the care that we can, and we believe that we are ahead of the curve. Now the show host's next question to him was, but they say 60% of us, all Australians will be infected I don't know if it was August or September or October or some point that he pointed out. And, um, you know, and that 20% of us might die. These headlines are, these are the headlines which talk about the worst of possibilities. You read the story, which has this horrific headline, you come to the very end of it. And the last two or three lines of that says, the possibilities of that scenario they said, they noted in the headline and they talked about throughout the article, unfolding are actually quite remote. It may never happen. So you've actually sat there in a big panic or been you know, glued to the television in a big panic thinking, oh my God, this is horrific. And then if you actually checked out in between for whatever reason, you're going away with the idea that this whole horrific scenario is going to play out. And you talk to someone, you put it on your social media, you put it on your WhatsApp group and the news spreads. So that, that uh, Australian media has not been uh, that much different um, in that sense from anywhere else. Um, but then when we came down from the intensity of the crisis, there was some evidence that media was trying to find a better tone or balance, um, or at least that there was some sign of introspection as they seek to push through some positive stories because the impact of the headlines and the reporting on mental um, and the reporting on the mental health of uh, people of an already disrupted nation, as millions of jobs are lost and people are in dire straits and the economy heads into what, my, what is a recession for the first time in I think over 29 years, uh, that was one of the factors that led to this introspection. Um, unfortunately, the flattened curve in Australia has suddenly resurged again. One of our states, Victoria, uh, where uh, you'll be familiar with the capital city, Melbourne, is in the throes of a new surge. Borders are closed tight. Suddenly, Victoria, its premier, its people, its medical officers have all become quite suspect. Um, uh, so we return once more to a bit of panic reporting as the government works to try and control the spread. However, they have also, the media has also rightly questioned um, some of the government messaging, especially around the easing of the lockdown, how it was done, um, the opening of schools in the midst of the crisis, which happened, long story, um, too long to recount here, um, the use of masks, whether to use it or not to use it, um, those kinds of things which the media have rightly questioned. Um, so, is, is this much different from elsewhere? Um, to a great, uh, to some degree, yes, um, because as I said, the media chose to work on that uh, national sort of front uh, initially and in the first um, 16 weeks or so of the pandemic. Um, but of course, even, 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 uh, you know, even though they did that, as um, Vinny was saying, this idea that people want sensationalism, um, and that for the media business these days, clickbait is what brings clicks through onto the online forums. And so uh, even Australian media have um, slipped into um, that sensationalism, that panic racing, um, that um, sort of tone of crisis um, at uh, different parts of this whole um, discussion. 
Um, and uh, I guess it's uh, this, the same in the US or um, in India or anywhere else. So on that, I mean, having said that much, I will now stop just to, uh, that was just to give you a quick context. And if you have any questions later on, of course, I'm most happy to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Dina Devi, for the very informative take on the political situation and the present situation in Australia, as well as the COVID situation. We are happy to know that in Australia there is a national uh, cabinet with the opposite orders. I'm sorry, the sir, I can't hear you very well. Sir, sir, your audio is not clear, sir. Uh, we, are, we are happy that in Australia, there is a national emergency cabinet with the yes. opposition members also. Yes. Right? Uh, this, is, this is a very, very happy situation because you now in a pandemic like the COVID-19 pandemic, it is always better that we have a government uh, with the opposition also. But what happens in India and what happens particularly in Kerala is that the opposition is up against all, all the initiatives by the government whether it is at the, at the national government or at the state level. There is opposition from the opposition parties. And, and recently, Kerala High Court had made a judgment restricting these people from making uh, agitations, particularly during the COVID pandemic. Okay, that is what is happening here. And you talked about uh, the press meet also. And Vinita also uh, talked about the press meet also. But here the opposition say that it is a media mania of the ministers. Giving out information every day is a media mania of the op of the ruling party. Okay. Anyway, it, it's a good take on the COVID situation and the press situation in Australia. Thank you very much. And we'll come back to you again. And now I am asking my friend in Trivandrum, this region who is working, uh, with, he's leading a team of reporters and editors uh, of uh, Times of India in Trivandrum. He's a very vibrant, very energetic, very dynamic person. I welcome uh, this region. Okay, Srijan? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vijayamur, sir, for the kind words. Thank you, Father Sobi for the kind words and the invite. And I'm seeing Gidanjali for the first time, but Vinny was my classmate and we are uh, good friends for the last two decades or so. So, well, what I have to uh, tell you all today is I am one of the journalists who are working on the field during the pandemic, ever since the beginning of the pandemic. So uh, I think I, rather than theorizing all these things, I can share you the practical dilemmas and experiences, uh, what I have gone through since the beginning of the first case in Kerala, that was on January, reporting of the first case in uh, Kerala was on January 30th. So it has been six months, more than six months. So I must say uh, the position of any journalist who is working at this time covering the pandemic is uh, like someone who is in the midst of what I said, devil deep sea. No, I don't think they will they will deep sea or something else, an Ulkan or something. So it's a very big crisis for us personally. So the first question, the devil devil comes in the form of reporting the pandemic. So so it is not like any other uh, events that we normally report. You can that you can you can take an easy perspective and reporting what all, what all you see and conveying what all you see. So you have to have your own restrictions. You have to know some something cannot be reported or something you have to withhold till the official announcement comes. So, so many restrictions need to be uh, so so part of our etiquette, reporting etiquette at such situation. So this is a crisis. I think it is a crisis in some other. So uh, in Kerala, what happened is that so in January, we reported it quite well. And it, it was that when the pandemic began to spread in Kerala, 
so actually there there are two rounds of meetings one, one meeting was uh, called by the chief minister himself he uh, summoned all the editors and editors of all media and discussed how will be the approach of the media and government there was another meeting which called by the, which was called by the chief secretary also of the editors so in both these meetings uh, so the, there was some sort of a consensus evolved that all the authentic information regarding the spread of the uh, disease will be reported to the media only after the official announcement even if i came i came came to know about a death or something today and if the government uh, accounts it only tomorrow and uh, announce it we will only report it tomorrow so some kind of an understanding that has been reached between all media so so that was one precautions we took so all the official uh information about the media about the spread of the disease and about the guidelines to be followed and all we all agreed to follow whatever the government officially re- uh, releases through the health, health ministry or to the relation so that was on pattern which all the mainstream media has been continuously following for all these days i don't i didn't see any major aberration in these things rather than Uh, we'll see in last week there was some controversy re- in kochi regarding the number of patients uh, there was some ca- sort of hiding the actual numbers or something so that time opposition leveled it as an issue and we had to report uh, so, some aberrations like that were there but we more or less tend to the government uh, directives on this situation because that was uh, something to what i say uh, keep the balance and not to create any additional panic or something so but even in that that area but people like me i i face a moral dilemma on that i i i i have strong uh, what is a dissent with these concepts so in kerala we for example so in my paper the count of total death in kerala is 41 if you take any other my i mean times of in any other paper it will be only 40 so how come this different so there was one mahi native who died in kannur and the kerala government still not counts him as a casual so i so we took an editorial position to count him in so that is because uh, that is the minimum dignity he deserves while in death what is the point in uh, denying that fact so but the kerala government is adamant that they never count that so we are from that day itself we are adding on more death and we are in bracket we will tell the death of mahru the mahi native who uh, died in kannur that was also accounted so such situations are created by the government itself when we we tend to cooperate with them so this so far they, i think i in our paper we have done half a dozen stories why this mahru that is not counted i think indian express has done so many stories on the same issue the government it has been i think for two and a half months the government is yet to give a satisfactory reply so this this is very tragic situation for the family of that man we have interviewed his son and all and did a story so they were totally taken aback by this even in that his existence is denied so such situations are there so we will we will say the government whatever maybe you are direct to that is enough letter so we will take positions in such cases but not to add to panic to anyone so uh, also Oh, uh, as uh, Vini and all referred, uh, the daily press conferences. Uh, I think whatever may be the opposition uh, criticism and all, I think it is a good strategy. The government, uh, the health minister, or the chief minister coming himself and briefing us about the day's uh, development. It, it 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 creates confidence to the government. It uh, gives us a feeling that things are very transparent and all. It is uh, very important in a crisis. communication scenario so all those i think i appreciate the government for taking that lead that such such initiatives are not coming from the central government all even when you when you compare it with the central government's opaque way of handling the issue the kerala things are very 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 transparent and i we need to appreciate the government for that also so so uh, after addressing all this moral dilemma moral dilemma so also when we report so what will be the kind of reporting so i personally i i personally i always tell my team i i always prefer to come uh, tell them to come with positive stories we don't need to sell panic this much this is very 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 irritating so you already uh, as gitanjali is it when you say that so they were uh, kind of a report in kerala also some 
uh, eight lakh people will fall victim to covid in another one month some some uh, disaster management authorities so that is some worst case scenario report they have prepared so as a um, disaster management authority it is their duty to prepare such a report but the call is ours whether we should highlight it and report it or not it is our call so i personally believe that that is some fact you may refer to it somewhere no don't highlight that so you will always have to highlight positive things so we have recently launched a series uh, nationally bounce back stories so we are telling how people are telling how business are getting bounced back to normalcy because i think we are we we are of firm belief that it is time to open up so uh, yesterday economic times has a story the, against this localized lockdown so in my place i vijay sir rightly said this is a th- tomorrow we are entering into the third week of lockdown all my friends my friends who are running the small businesses small offices they are all shattered because this is third continuous week they couldn't shop they are open uh, they couldn't open their shop no business is happening nothing and so the same thing happened in uh, march april may also almost three months lockdown was there and after once they began started to bounce back the government is again closing down all these things so oh, such situations are bad i think we today in trivandrum city pages we have done a very detailed story on how traders are losing the plot because of the unscientific lockdown the city administration has imposed so so now it is time now the media have to focus on bounce back stories and positive stories there is no point in selling the pan- panic because i i think it is going to be world over let us live with corona going to be the new theme and we need to keep all the precautions but we need to uh, slowly restart our normal life so the duty of media in the coming phase will be to promote all such opening up initiatives and pro- support all such initiatives that is what i strongly feel so what i say the second angle if i what i refer to devils and uh, deep sea so deep sea is the uh, as gitanjali rightly said the extended control of the government control government has uh, it is very natural in all such crises each government tends to be a control freak the same thing is happening here here also uh, vini told me this question yes in uttar pradesh madhya pradesh and in andhra pradesh and tamil nadu i think cases have been registered against journalists so because they they reported true they, they they those were all reports based on true factual incidents but the government didn't uh, announce it officially but these re- uh, journalists reported it so all these uh, horror acts were uh, slapped on them the cases were taken and all so so such such situation is uh, happening in kerala in another way because uh, you may remember many of some of you may at least remember when the pandemic started so we were all in a crisis so that is natural it is there so the first thing the state government uh, announced was a 54 crore rehab package for media so the prd has uh, been asked to settle all the pending bills of media so almost all media were happy so there were no cash flow no revenue nothing on that month in, uh, media in kerala was given 54 crore bill by the government so this is this carrot the carrot was dangled so so there was some understanding that uh, so they, they they are helping us at a time of crisis and we should be what is we should be gentle to them during the criticism and all because we are not getting you know, if, in our company i think I, we get 4 on 4 four to 4.5 crore from that money so this is uh, something else 8 or 9 crore is the, what manorama got from that so so this is we are getting this in april may when there is nil zero advertisement from private clients we are no, not getting revenue from anybody else and the government is giving us crores so it's quite natural that uh, even we even if i go to the press conference of chief minister this will be in my mind i think he is giving us bread or something so i should be a little bit thankful to him so 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 that is another way of taming the media so the criticism has tamed down a lot if you watch if you wish watch all media all mainstream media in kerala the criticism in government in handling the crisis is invisible it is not there at all so we always uh, celebrate the positive stories success stories and it, we celebrate so there so we have to resist or manage the 
control exerted by the state on the reporting and democracy and even the freedom of movement. Now, I, I, I must say, this is a thing. What is the logic in slapping lockdown on a city just because you have some, what is it, is it only 700 cases or something? All to, no, 1,000 cases altogether in the last three, uh, three weeks and you are in lockdown for 1,000 cases. Nobody is uh, challenging that because uh, we, have, we, are, we are, tend to be very, very liberal towards the government. So it is the it is another second time. Then the third one, I must say, what is it? this is earthquake or volcano. So the crisis in my industry, we are facing the worst crisis. As Vijayma said, Vijayma said, said the subscription, lots of subscription, that is very 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 serious issue because of this fortnight transmission theories. People are tending to uh, unsubscribe newspapers. So in Kerala. Fortunately, the impact is very less. Vijumasa's case is a case study. I think in my apartment, I only three or four stopped the newspaper. All the other 35 houses are still subscribing newspaper. I am checking that regularly. So, but in Kerala, we haven't affected that much. But in Mumbai and all, uh, there, uh, there, there were situations mainstream media had short the, uh, cut short the print order to one tenth. One tenth. You are selling. Uh, six lakh copy daily, and during the pandemic, your print order is only sixty thousand. So that was the impact we faced in uh, Mumbai, Delhi, Chennai, and all. So in all these markets, we are, uh, all the newspapers are now slowly picking up the copies. But I don't think it will never reach the original count after. So there will be loss in the form of subscription and advertisement. As I said, in April and May, private sector advertisement was near nil. But as uh, if my, I say my uh, example in from my organization, we you, normally on a month we tend to do four four point five crore of advertisement and all. But in April we only do fifteen lakh, and in May it was thirty two lakhs or something. So it is a crisis is real. Crisis is real and crisis is very serious. And as you all know, the job losses in India there is no. Total count of journalist jobs and non journalist jobs lost in media. But an appropriate estimate, if I can say, is including national media and regional media, at least 3,000 journalists have lost the job in the last two, three months. I have read somewhere in America the count is 30,000 journalist jobs lost. If you take the non journalist job also in the media industry, at least 10,000 jobs have already gone in India in the last three months. So in the coming months, if the situation doesn't improve, I must say in August, uh, by August, September, another round of job cuts will be there. More people will be out of job. So, so the crisis as a journalist for me is, I have to report a pandemic. This is one of the events that I think is the uh, uh, worst crisis or worst opportunity for me as a journalist in my career. And I am dealing that crisis in the backdrop of all these challenges. So, so I myself have felt that when I plan, we plan so many packages, stories, and we don't have manpower to spend, then we will, there will be naturally the other, other expenses will also be curtailed. There'll be a cut, cut on expenditure, like we can't hire taxis for an assignment. And so all these uh, expenses will be curtailed because our revenue flow is hit. So the, even in this opportunity, we can uh, give an, our hundred percent to report our, all these things and all. So the coverage has been also slightly affected. But from our part and all, what we did to overcome this is that. So we have uh, started new arenas, new new areas of reporting, data journalism, for example. This crisis uh, created the best opportunity. Uh, for journalists, practicing journalists to become data journalists. So, so many data crunching stories, so many infographics, so many interesting graphics and all uh, were published in all the mainstream media. So, we all now take the data, dashboards are there, so many dashboards, John Hopkins University dashboard is there, ROQ Sedu is there, COVID-19 Info Kerala, there is a nice uh, open source uh, platform is there. We all go there Daily, we visit the site, we get pick up interesting data and we create interesting data stories and data infographic and all. So that was one way to overcome this crisis uh, and all. So such practices are also uh, have taken have been taken pla taking place 
uh, in the industry. So this is all. I think these are the main points I wanted to stress. This is really from the field that what I what I experienced on the field and all. So anything else? I'll answer the question. Thank you again. Uh, Vijay Kumar sir, just unmute your mic, sir. Just unmute. Have uh, have muted. Left side bottom, sir. Left side bottom. Sir, left bottom. Sir, you must... No, sir, Vijayma, sir, your mic is not connected actually. Sir, your mic is your mic is not connected. Vijayma, sir, your mic is connected. Is it not? I think it is not connected. Okay, okay. Ah, now it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm happy. Very, very, very happy that Sweden has suspended uh, the real situation of the media in Kerala, particularly in Kerala, and a grim scenario because now, uh, without the government support now, most of these papers would have uh, closed their shutters. And there is going to be a downside in the immediate future. I don't know whether uh, Times of India has uh, initiated downsizing, but naturally, quite naturally, downsizing happened in the media. And as uh, Sweden has pointed out, the analysis is going to be the future journalism. And now we are interesting. Data in our also. Uh, because now I have taken the account. Audio is not clear. Sir. sir, audio is not clear. Audio is now not clear. Not yeah. Not clear? Now, now it's clear. Yeah, you can speak now. Okay. 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 And now I call on the participants. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali, are you Dr. Muhammad Ali. Are you there? Muhammad Ali? Can, can you hear me? Dr. Muhammad Ali? <clears throat> not there. He's not there. Dr. Lakshmi Pradeep? Lakshmi Pradeep is there? Lakshmi Pradeep. She is not there. Now, participants can unmute your mic. If you are Hello. there, you can unmute. Hello. Your... Yeah. I'm Lakshmi <laughs> Pradi. Yeah, yeah. Good morning. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, can you briefly uh, make a comment on the present day three presentations here? Certainly, okay. certainly. Uh, first of all, okay. uh, I would like to thank uh, Vijay Kumar sir and Father Sobi for this wonderful initiative. Actually, now we are living in a time when there are so many webinars and very often I'm very afraid of them because some of them are such a waste of time. But this was such a refreshingly different one. And uh, I found it such an interesting, informative and enlightening uh, program. First of all, I would like to appreciate the choice of the participants, the speakers. We got a perspective of USA, Australia and also right here in Kerala. So I think it was really a wonderful initiative. Um, my question, actually, um, is to the Western, um, to both Gitanjali and uh, Neeta. Um, I came across a few reports that uh, the elderly people, elderly women, they are sidelined, they are marginalized, that um, our Western world is very often fixed on glamour and youth. And so uh, when there are too many patients, the elderly people are just left to die. 
I I think it must be an exaggeration. But I just wanted to ask you because very often stereotyping happens like this. So is it true or is it an exaggerated hyperbole? Anyone of you? So first, Vinita, Vinita can answer or Vinita Anjali can answer. Yeah. Okay, or both can answer. Okay, Vinita. Anjali, would you like to go first, Anjali? Ella, Vinny, Vinny, um, you respond first because you have a much larger scale of uh, yeah. How unfortunate to is that? To. Oh, yeah. How unfortunate a situation to be in. But anyway, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to uh, thank her for her sweet words. Um, if it is refreshing and informative, informative. Yeah. Um, let me understand this question first. Are you asking whether medical professionals discriminate against the old people and keyboard young? Was that the question, or uh -huh. was it connected to the media? If in hospitals, yes, because of the sheer number of people reporting, hospitals were overwhelmed. But I do not have a single um, source to quote that any sort of discrimination happened um, just because they were old. Ventilator situation, uh, the lack of ventilators or ventilators not working properly might have happened in some areas or um, in the US. I have read such reports in mainstream US media. Uh, the thing is, someone gets onto a ventilator, stay there for 14 days. This is what one doctor told me. If that person has comorbidities, if the person is old, there is a very rare chance of coming out of it after 14 days. And this is nothing new. I mean, this is not a situation uh, where they had a situation I mean, this situation did not happen just because of the pandemic. That's been the uh, rule in the hospital to make a decision after talking to the relatives. Was that the question I, I, I am trying to understand? Is that the, yes. are you talking about the ethical yeah. challenge of the doctors? You know, what I was trying to say is, uh, you know, it's so sad that sometimes the old, the already the have not, very often in the Western world, we know that the old people have their own problems, like they don't have the family support and all that. And particularly old women, very often they are not financially well off. So, uh, is there a sort of discrimination to that effect? That that was my question. You can't call it up. I don't know if we call it discrimination, but thank you for bringing this up. In fact, I wanted to mention it at some point. A lot of these deaths happened in nursing homes, as you call the long-term care facilities. Yes, there is a difference in our um, culture. In we, we tend to stay with our parents or grandparents, correct? You know, we have a situation like that. And pe people um, mostly live independently in the US. Of course, especially if they have medical issues, they are admitted to long-term care facilities. It's particularly in New York and New Jersey, this virus, there was an outbreak in such nursing homes and it really cost a lot of lives. This was one thing. Um, that was, <coughs> excuse me. So if that is a question, I have to say, yes, there was a situation in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. I mean, it is not discrimination by the other doctor. I mean, these were centers meant for old people and who were unwell. And when there was a virus surge, these people could not resist. That's the nature of this virus, correct? What we understand, there might be some expect, uh, exceptions, but this is serious for people who are old and people who are unwell, especially with some pre-existing conditions. Unfortunate, but yes, nursing homes were badly hit. Thank you, uh, thank you. If, if I might uh, jump in then, uh, Yes? Uh, continue, continue, continue. Uh, yes. Um, so if I if I might just address the um, um, actual question, um, as far as Australia is concerned, or New Zealand, or many of the countries that I'm conscious of, I don't think there is a deliberate sidelining of old people because younger people are uh, better, you know, uh, more wanted or um, anything of the sort. I think that that is a misrepresentation if that is uh, what has been done. Um, like Vinny said, the culture in India for us in India or across Asia, we cherish our um, um, older generations, we cherish our parents, um, they're our gods, uh, we cherish our um, older relatives um, and we um, 
we always um, try and hold them close and keep them close to us. Um, the culture is quite different in Western countries where um, children leave homes at 16 or 17 uh, to go and you know, um, make their own lives. Uh, the connections between um, uh, you know, um, families is therefore quite different from the ones that we cherish uh, in our culture. And it's not that one is right and one is wrong. It's just quite simply how they do it here. Um, and uh, a lot of old people, like um, uh, Vinny said, they live their own lives and then when they reach a point where they cannot care for themselves, they either check themselves into uh, long term uh, facilities or retirement homes where there is support systems available for them or the, or the children themselves make that decision on their behalf and do it. However, we've had in Australia in the last uh, five years or so, we've had a Royal Commission uh, inquiry into the aged care facilities because the treatment was, uh, you know, in many across the country was horrific, but that has uh, become the focus of a, a massive uh, federal inquiry and um, the, it's all being um, sort of fixed under the regulatory advice at the moment. But here's the thing with, um, with COVID, much of the focus actually of the, you know, the force of the uh, health system, um, the first point of care really was the older people here. Because what everyone said exactly as Vinny said, the older people are more vulnerable and therefore uh, here in Australia, the decision was made that they're the ones who need the absolute focused care. All aged care homes were shut in lockdown. Not even families were able to visit because they just wanted to make sure they're absolutely insulated or in bubbles from this uh, infection. Um, in hospitals, all, uh, you know, um, the preference usually if you went in and there was a queue, the preference was usually for the older uh, generation, quite simply because unless you had other comorbidities or you had other issues that needed you to be at the front of the queue, um, it, it was quite obvious, at least here, that uh, the younger generation the impact of the infection on them was less serious than it was the old. So if there was any suggestion that in Australia, at least I can tell you for sure, and New Zealand, um, that uh, old people were sidelined where while the younger people were looked after during this pandemic, total, I can't use the word here. So no, it wasn't the truth. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and thank you for the question. So, no, let me thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. And now I'm um, all upon. Uh, Ipan Alexander is there? Ipan Alexander? Ipan Alexander? Can you can unmute your mic if you are there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Now, now you can briefly. Uh, respond yes uh, okay. um, yes i'm very happy to attend this and i'm very glad that i've, I've, I've been able to listen uh, a very productive webinar and especially i'm very happy to uh, happy to see uh, srijan sir he has been my mentor for two months and i've learned a lot a lot about journalism practical journalism from him and uh, this is a question very uh, specific uh, to srijan sir as well as uh, to the other uh, speakers Sir, uh, for the past uh, few months after the lockdown, uh, when we are looking at a national scenario, uh, we have seen there is a war mongering uh, among the national media. That, that there were journalists who were actually asking for a war against China. We had a border conflict and uh, stuff like that. And now we have a gold smuggling case and the way it has been reported uh, is, uh, to be honest, uh, fr if you're looking at uh, from a uh, you know, progressive thinker, it has been very misogynistic, to be honest, the way they have uh, portrayed uh, or uh, reported uh, the thing. And the, what is happening is people are, the attention of the people is being uh, diverted from the ongoing pandemic to uh, uh, sensational stories. And that is one problem which is uh, making, uh, you know, many people uh, and many people were critical of the way the media has dealt with uh, the, the ongoing pandemic for the past two months. And when we are looking at the global scenario, now there are cases, for example, in the US uh, where the president said, you know, you can inject 
what 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 uh, the sanitizer to prevent covid from uh, to prevent covid or something like that and uh, maybe it, uh, it could be his misinformation but there were actually people injecting the uh, injecting that uh, injecting the disinfectants and uh, sanitizers and it was reported by the global media and in brazil uh, the president he is still uh, reluctant to wear mask and uh, and brazil is uh, actually it, 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 they, are, they are going to a, a state of atrocity and on a national level i feel uh, the people are actually getting bored uh from getting the relevant information about covid and we are uh, the attention of the people are being diverted so i really would like to uh, know what is your opinion and i really miss uh, your opinions about uh, all these issues so i would really like to know how uh, these things affect and i also want to know what the other speakers think about this hi ipan thank you so the will come to point directly on uh, regarding the overdose of covid coverage i think now we have reached the a saturation point and people tend to lose attention unless we provide some interesting good stuff um, <laughs> so we, we you can you cannot every day write that you have to wear mask you have to sanitize your hands or something like that so these input pieces has its uh, limitations so the number game also after a after a, when kerala crossed that 10000 marks i think we are now losing our interest so it is like another 1000 kids another 2000 kids so we are slowly we, so this news will slowly be sidelined that is for sure that is how the newspaper industry or media works each day is a fresh day and each news is a fresh news so covid is also becoming a stale news slowly so i think in another month or so we will uh, give the figure somewhere inside like this kambola nilavaram column or something so it is going to happen that way there is no choice <laughs> so re- re- regarding this uh, coverage on gold smuggling and all I, my personal view is very clear on that you have to report the crime that there is no question about that but being someone being a woman and uh, she happens to be one among the accused there is no point in focusing sh- her alone and uh, no point in chasing her alone no point in chasing her antecedents and all so if you f- have followed our paper i think we have been slightly different we didn't even carry a picture of this sopna suresh along with any of the readers so nothing we on the first day itself we took a decision not to carry such decision we never went behind all the nasty trails and all we just pro- we had to give her profile on the day like people will be so even that profile was a very balanced one the one profile of him she was saying we carried was also very balanced one with we acknowledged the good work he has done all through his career and then saying the fall of him and what led to that and all so there uh, but people still are so that i i i must say i will say among my, my colleagues i will say this marunad and malayali mindset that is what i say <laughs> even if we do, we cover or not marunad and malayali covers it and everyone is going to read and watch that so so who is the culprit here so if i i i write a fair story on this crime and post on the social media 100 people will read and if shahjan skarya writes uh, on social media i like people will read so that is the difference So, so i think as readers and people are the real culprits in this they want only sensationalism not the media so i think and now I shall i count upon kanimuri yes. kanimuri thank you sir kanimuri is there kanimuri i've seen that name maybe mike is, is there kanimuri yeah, uh, you can you can unmute your mic ജയകുമാർ സാർ um our elsinami is ready with the questions of participants but they have asked in their in the chat 
Elsina is ready with the questions of participants. They have asked in the uh, chat box. Elsina, please. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, sir, may I ask? Oh, okay. Yes, sir, may I proceed? Yeah, okay. okay we, you have, proceed. Uh, we have uh, n number of questions in the chat box. A uh, couple of questions to take. Uh, I'm taking here for the discussion. Um, the one question is, uh, yeah, uh, there are lots of questions asked by Swadhi Venugopal. I'm uh, taking two, three questions of her. What is your opinion on telecasting sensitive news during pandemic? How are media handling the rumors during the pandemic? And next question is that, what is the role of media handling the mental health of people during the pandemic? Panel, please comment on the question. Sir. Okay, may I repeat? What is your opinion? Oh, okay. Sensitive news during pandemic. Telecasting sensitive news during pandemic. And what is the role of media handling the mental health of people during the pandemic? So shall I, sir? Uh, sir, please. Yeah, okay. So I think the sensitive news, uh, there is nothing like that. Dasai Ali said, whatever is happening is news. It is a nice event. If there is a crime happens it naturally becomes news even if there is a pandemic there is a good crime it's a good news so we need to carry that so uh, regarding the mental health also i think uh, that is important if you see the visual media and all there is this dr jodhika programs and all they all have psychologists every week in their panels so they are uh, uh, telling these tips to how to be mentally stable and how to be stay positive and all, and we from our end also we are carrying such story from also positive stories. There are a lot of positive stories are also coming up on the media. Even the people who are losing jobs, they are finding a secondary jobs and doing well. Uh, even we did a story of some uh, on film uh, designer, film poster designer Indrajit his name in Kochi. So he lost the job, and the next day he joined another shop, a Tattukada as a parotta maker. And he earned some 1,200 rupees per day. So it's quite a good amount. So he, the, so that is, the, so the, the story is very sad. Uh, there is a sad element to it. His positivity and his resolution to fight the pandemic, that is commendable. So such stories also we include in our daily coverage so that people stay positive. People can be nothing, not, not everything is lost. Something like that we, we are also creating. So that is important also, the coverage. I think that needs to be stepped up now in the next phase. We need to give more positivity and we need to uh, prompt people to open up. So that is the next level of reporting we have to do. If, if I might also, if I might also comment around that, um, I think that the mental health um, question is actually quite an important one because I think um, the media actually in the midst of a crisis such as this, of course, this pandemic is something that none of us ever expected to um, uh, live uh, and see happen. But when a crisis like this happens, I think the media does play a very important role um, in making sure that the tone and balance of the reporting, um, whether it's of sensitive news or the crisis, the crisis has to be reported as it happens. It's important. People need to know what's going on. People need to know what care they need to take um, to help themselves. People need to know how their life is going to be changed by this, how they need to care for other people in their families or their extended groups. So the media does have a big responsibility to play in reporting all of that. Um, and as Srijan said, it's not so much sensitive. It's, it's about reporting the news with the correct tone and balance. Um, so that you're not sensationalizing it. I do get Srijan's point, which he made earlier, that um, he he may put the news through straightforward just as it is, and there might be a million others who are sensationalizing it. He gets 100 readers and everyone else gets a million. So, but that, that still is, you know, that's a choice that media and uh, journalists have to take. It's a moral dilemma, but I always believe that in moral dilemmas, if there is a moral dilemma, there is a right, there is a wrong, the choice is yours to make. Um, with mental health in, um, in um, Australia, for instance, uh, the media has played quite a strong role because they have taken an active um, interest. It has been one of the things around which there has been much reporting. 
uh, in terms of what will be the impact, what is the impact. Um, and uh, here, the mental health services largely are supported by not-for-profit organizations um, and charities who obviously, when the um, uh, COVID-19 uh, struck, many of them had to send away their people, stand them down, close down. They had no volunteers to support because the volunteers were too busy trying to get their own lives in order because they've lost jobs and they're trying to survive. Um, so the media actually worked with the not-for-profit and charity sector because when um, the economic support uh, packages were announced and there's considerable large economic um, um, sort of support uh, packages were announced. The not-for-profit sector was left out of it initially, but um, the media worked uh, very strongly and very actively and very positively with the not-for-profit and charity sector to bring that to the fore and uh, to bring public opinion, the force of public opinion together and, um, and immediately the government did actually respond and act, though I'm not saying that it's only because the media reported it. Of course, obviously, the leaders of the sector have um, gone to government and brought the considerable force of their um, influence together, but media played a really big role in it. So I, I do think that, um, you know, the media does have a responsibility around that. Christina, can you hear me? Christina? Yes, Christina. Elsina. Elsina. Are there any more questions? Elsina, please. Can I ask yes. just Can one I... more question? Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Please. Anyone else? Yeah. Please. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. please Actually, I wanted to ask you, how is the concept of global village now going to be? We've heard of Marshall McLuhan's global village. We all have grown up with that in our communication classes. Now, I wonder if you're going to go back onto all that, back to our villages. And another question, again, to Srijan Balakrishnan. Um, what do you think is the future of the print, particularly in India? Because um, yeah, Times of India made it in the um, by April, <laughs> April, <laughs> April, I have taken my paper, Calicut edition. Uh, I grew up in Mumbai, so I started with Times of India in my childhood. It was a habit. Times of India was a habit from my childhood. So, uh, April, March, April, I had a paper very thin, very thin, very slender and thin. And I think uh, much before they announced their... Uh, Stopping the Calicut edition itself, the paper stopped, I think, to Ramnatigara Calicut side. I don't know why. Anyway, about uh, Ippa the Indian Express, again, they started becoming very slim of late. The number of pages have reduced day by day. I don't know when it will stop. I'm actually worried. Any poor English paper would have kit and keep the worry I'm feeling is I wonder if we will get an English paper. Uh, if, uh, uh, what do you think sir, is the future of the print, particularly the English newspapers in Kerala? As a reader who wants to read English newspapers, I'm worried actually. That's why I'm asking you. No, uh, no I think I, I'll pass that global uh, village questions to somebody else. I think Geeta Jilio okay. or Vinika can answer that. Fine, fine. Vinita, 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 Vinita can answer that. Yeah, Vinita. ോട്ട് <laughs> Oru lekhanam endayirunu that i read sometime i think middle of or end of march june il new jersey la ottumikkal perkum njan thamaskana new jersey state aanallo ibide ee corona virus affected aagum nore oru adhi bhayangaramaya oru apocalyptic prediction undayirunu satyam nadu vaayil continuing english because there are people from outside kerala oh all, all right all right and i thought the question Malayalam, I was uh, talking, uh, she asked 
the global uh, village is it still relevant or you know uh, i was i would rephrase it's a global challenge that we have um, but i do not think this would last forever i at least saw one question that was coming in the chat uh, box whether there is a vaccine a lot of clinical trials are going all over the globe in um, the us moderna vaccine they uh, i think they now at the third level of the trial it seems the global village concept is there and uh, we will overcome the global challenge and as as a village we all will be together at some point of time this is what i personally believe and there are reports coming from harvard university john hopkins and continue everywhere giving their perspective their analysis but uh, at least by next spring in a year or year and a half there should be a vaccination and herd immunity i'm leaving to sreejan maybe you can comment on it and at least some sort of a, a proper treatment protocol where a particular drug would work in most cases at least <clears throat> we might have a different situation and we can get back on track at least probably in another 6 months or that is my hope the global can village I <laughs> can i make a comment on that to follow up yeah, please sreejan yeah, yeah. sir okay um my actually my sense is that it's going to be a lot more challenging to get to get back to this idea of a global village because one of the first things that happened when this pandemic struck and the global nature of it came to um play is that borders closed supply chains were disrupted distribution networks were disrupted and suddenly um many of the nations that were dependent on whether it was china or any other uh country or us or anyone in the europe that was dependent on a a different country or multiple different countries for uh their supply and distribution um they suddenly um have come to have this feeling of we need to be self sufficient that sense of nationalism and individualism i can see it playing out really strongly everywhere definitely here it that has been uh, in the national discussion um it's not it's not it's definitely not the right way for us to progress but with how geopolitics is all playing out i have a feeling that it will be some time before we head back into that um uh, uh full full sort of idea of multilateralism or globalism um but what covid has actually done is it has exposed not only you know on the one hand it has exposed the vulnerabilities of supply chains and all of those sorts of things but it has also exposed um or or brought to the fore the need for a more sort of collaborative glo globalism not a a, a con confrontational globalism but a collaborative globalism a true multilateralism so that it when a crisis hits at the moment we are all trying to make bubbles we are all trying to close our borders keep them sealed keep everyone else away at what point will we go back to that thing of talking to each other and then working as a global whole i don't know but covid if it has done one thing is on the one hand um generated a lot of nationalism and individualism on the other hand it has exposed the need for a more collaborative globalism that's my feeling so if i answer to that part i must say global digital village has already there already been there is is here i think it's already here so it is going to be a global village sans logistics i think more convenient and more 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 swift so that is there so uh, regarding this print issue so i will speak to you not on behalf of times of india so i have a conflict of interest here so i am putting my official identity there and i'm coming back to a journalist or media student so the print in india is facing an unprecedented crisis that is true whatever we deny so india was own country which has resisted the global trend of decline in print we were Uh, publishing reports of even every six months we were publishing audit reports of newspaper circulation growing the readership growing up and all uh, that is going to be a tale of the past so we have we are all this i think this covid has come as a handy excuse for all of us even before that in 2018-19 the revenues or revenue of all major print uh, uh, organizations have fallen down steeply so digital is replacing it it is 
going to digital going to be digital as like everywhere in the world so the print crisis is here to stay um i don't know so for us and all it is very it was very painful for uh, us to cope up with that situation we have to wound up two edition um, and it is uh, i don't know the editions we have slowly built up brick by brick we built up the editions in an eight years and all copies the one fine morning we have decided to stop 53000 copies just by writing up two editions so this is a very painful decision for us but I, as an insider i know the cost factor so you will never believe the cost factor the loss we are making the bleeding every day we are bleeding like that because uh, not only because of the covid crisis and all the what do you say for the print media the distribution itself is a mess now so you lo- you lose a hell lot of money by distributing the product you wa- you want to hire uh, taxis to take all these products to the routes every day and all uh, so if i say if, uh, in my edition we have column copies we had some 3 4000 copies in column and for for distributing that 4000 copies for distributing that 4000 copies we need eight vehicles we need to hire eight vehicles uh, from kadakota and kolla kadakota means our printing press is located so per month our uh, distribution cost itself will come to 2.2 lakh and we sell paper 3 rupees per copy and 1.6 rupees is going to the vendor so we get 1.4 rupees per copy. subscriber has to pay for the product if i if i sell my product at 25 rupees or 30 rupees per day will you subscribe then we can create a win win situation and run the industry so far we are we are doing this subsidized the model and subsidized the model is not going to work uh, given the steep increase in the cost of logistics and the sharp decline in the advertisement revenue so this is this is a real crisis for trade so Okay. I don't know. I think I I uh, think even like is there a, now. Dr. Mohammed, sir, I I have one more one more point to add. See, the okay, Lakshmi okay. teacher can easily subscribe to our e-paper. Our e-paper is available one ninety nine per month. No, can, actually, the thing is, you know, you're so used to the hard copy from your childhood, <laughs> you want it in hand. But thank you so like, much uh, like to all the panelists uh, for such an articulate and a lucid response. Thank you so much to all three of you. Thank you. Srijan, can I ask you one quick, quick question to follow up on that? Um, do you think no. that the COVID pandemic, what it has done is it has speeded up the transition of uh, traditional media onto, as you said, the global village, the global digital village? Because, um, you know, with uh, uh, print editions increasingly becoming too expensive and uh, uh economically not viable for uh media do you think that what covid has done is actually it I hasn't yes, changed exactly. anything drastically what it's doing is it's speeding up the process of the transformation exactly that has sped sped it up uh, i think i read a report uh, from australia also the murdoch has uh, that news corp has i think stopped 60 or 70 local newspapers together and they asked to move on to online platform so in india also the same thing is happening i think uh, times of india itself has stopped 15 editions in india we have some 56 edition that is now brought down to 41 so uh, telegraph has uh, stopped all edition except the kolkata east india they have seven or eight editions and all of them were stopped so hindu is planning to stop almost stop the mumbai edition and they are also planning to close down some remote editions so everyone is uh, into the bad bank and everyone is shop shutting shop only commercially viable units will here to stay otherwise they will be winding up so digital is the answer i think so they, there is some confusion over the revenue model but digital is the obvious answer you have to move uh, if i if i may uh, if i may add a point here uh, i suppose uh, i can can i or uh, am yeah, i yeah, interrupting sure, yeah, no, 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 
all right okay i have listened to you know great stalwarts uh, like all of you and uh, it's it's a real honor to be here with you guys and uh, i really thank uh, soviet and to you know organize for organizing this event and really appreciate this um, a few points uh, that i may i would like to make one is you know we got to recognize that we are in a situation um, which we can only say is a, is a new life Uh, ahead of us so there is got to be a pre covid as well as there is got to be a post covid or or a covid uh, you know covid situation in which we are living right now so it has its impacts on economics in in every way you can think about it um, i've been working in dubai for the last 25 years and my line of expertise among other things is logistics and supply chain and one aspect of it is media as well so it's a straight it, it, it's a strange kind of a marriage but uh, you know I, i'm also into media uh, sorry sir your your mic is mute now sorry sir oh i'm sorry uh, okay i i hope you can hear me now yeah, yeah, so yeah. so yeah. so um you know um those who are of my age or closer to my age would always love to have a piece of a print in the morning you know when you have your black coffee uh, so definitely that's that might change you know tomorrow you may not see the newspaper man coming with the newspaper with a hot news um yeah it's going to be a digi world now ahead of us in many ways um you know um the other day and right now i'm in kanjrapalli by the way i just managed to came in uh, come in here before the covid started and the other day you know we had a guy who comes to climb the coconut trees nammal sadharana malayalathil parayna thenga idna aala so he came and uh, you know we got talking and, and uh, we said something and suddenly he said adinenda sir google il nokkiya madiyallo so <laughs> so everyone is talking yeah. about google these days and everyone is talking okay. about thank you for your thank you for your take <laughs> on that and now i call on dr mohammad ali mohammad ali can you hear me yes sir yes sir i can hear can you hear me? can you can okay. you see me please. yeah here yeah, range okay. is range is very problematic Sir, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. I, I, during this pandemic time, I attended many seminars, many seminars or webinars. But of these all, I could got a very useful information, especially a 360 degree global reporting on pandemic from this uh, inputs given by our uh, experts, external experts. So, uh, thank you for all these uh, things. First of all, the second thing that I would like to put my some observations on uh, journalistic trend during this pandemic am i audible yes sir yes yes okay the first thing that i would like share with you that the the difference between the framing of pandemic by the central government as well as uh, the government of kerala if you go through the official community outbreak communication uh, announcements by central government as well as Uh, state government there are two for example narendra modi government used warfare meta- meta- war metaphors abundantly used war metaphors for framing the pandemic and airing it as part of sometimes as part of their outbreak communication policy when it comes to kerala chief minister uh, pinarayi vijayan conducted daily conferences daily press conferences and on all, all these conferences you can see a welfare state framework that he framed this then i think that uh, kerala sorted this kind of framework because here we have a critical audience critical mass critical population they are very discursive they are they are in a very discursive democratic setup that is why he has to be a, in such a responsible position to communicate with the people with the data while prime minister modi he has to address a huge uncritical mass 
then there is no need of any kind of uh, backup data to justify his things only the political rhetoric to work in that in such a scenario i think that would be the reason however what i noticed is that very interesting positive trends in reporting especially from the case of kerala for example here a responsible news reporting system evolved during this pandemic time everyone every reporter is for a responsible stand even the physical stand as well as the uh, the ideological stand in communicating the pandemic so there is a data driven reporting system evolved during this time we have been talking about data journalism but real data driven journalistic trend have been evolved during this time that is also a responsible stance from the part of the the newspapers or the the media fraternity another interesting trend is that uh, there is a theory that the dependency model of uh, communication during this kind of crisis and it really works in our situation especially um, uh, the first and second phase of the pandemic then at that time you must remember that cms conference was one of the most popular popular programs at that time and the bark uh, india report uh, board broadcast Audi- audience uh, research council report reports that it was one of the most uh, popular programs on malayalam television in the crisis time and it was also reported that the people from all walks of life irrespective of their gender and age watched the briefings from start to finish and this was aired by the newspapers without any commercial break that is also interesting it means that the interesting point is that at that time especially when it comes to television their program writing is on the rise at the same time they don't have any kind of income generation points in that this is a paradoxical situation anyhow the model that is a dependency model a social dependency model was at the work at that time that was my observation another interesting thing uh, related to media agenda setting Uh, there are two types of agenda policy agenda and media agenda most often we see in democracy media agenda sets the posi- posi- influence the policy agenda but when it comes to covid time especially first and second phase of the covid reporting we see that uh, me- policy agenda in the news outbreaking from the cm that instantly and uh, on the spot influences the uh, television and most often many a time i i i found that uh, news news uh, anchors they reprogrammed their prime time televised debates on the basis of the inputs from the uh, cms conference this is what i noticed then in many ways we have a lot of things to impipe from the crisis situation and um, with this observations uh, i extend my gratitude for giving me this chance to interact with you thank you very much if uh, okay dr mohammad ali Okay, yeah. Ali, your uh, your presentation was very solid. Uh, you have uh, that about the framing and the positioning and the dependence of theory of the mass media. I'm very 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 grateful to you for uh, making at the last moment a scholarly <laughs> positioning, <laughs> a scholarly positioning. Sir, shall I add one point to Mr. Ali sir? Okay. Sir, shall I add shall I add one point to Mr. Ali sir? Okay, okay, okay. You can ask a question. No, sir. Mohamed Ali, sir. sir the, as you said, the public agenda becoming media agenda point, the credibility of the source is also an important factor because yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The, the chief minister has a credibility factor, the strong credibility factor for himself. He has created such a credibility factor. So it is only natural that we need to follow whatever important announcement he say, the credible source, what he say. Yeah. yeah that's why he was backed with the data otherwise he would be a disaster because correct, the data correct. was important our and health minister spent the minutes both yeah 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 okay okay sir no he acted like a statesman he acted yeah, yeah. like a statesman that's true yeah, yeah. okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> where it is because of the, the critical uh, are there any other in kerala is now Uh, Vijay Kumar sir. Are there any other? Vijay Kumar sir. Okay, okay, please. I uh, I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Radha Krishnan sir. I can see him. Hello sir. <laughs> okay sir. 
Hello, He's hello. my guru. You know, he was the director of some of the very early programs I did for Doordarshan and Asia. And I just want to say hi to him and if he has any comments whatsoever. Yeah, you can, you can, you can. Oh, thank you, thank you, sir. I'm really thankful to you for having given me a chance to participate in this uh, uh, webinar. And I've been attending many webinars during the last four, last many days. And uh, I should uh, say from, from the heart of hearts that this is the most effective of all the webinars I've uh, seen during these days. And so um, uh, actually, let me congratulate uh, all the three resource persons, Mr. Sriraj, Ms. Anjali, and uh, my dear Vini, Vinita, uh, for putting up such a bright performance here over the topic given to them. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy that Vinita uh, is uh, now here uh, at uh, uh, actually the best of her uh, moments. And congrats, Vinita, for that. And I know it's not that the others are bad. <laughs> so not so no, no, you, <laughs> you coach me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was very informative for me uh, to listen from um, uh, Angie and of course. Yeah, yeah, really, really. It was really, it was really nice of all of you. All of you. And Mr. Mohamed Ali also, I should congratulate Mr. Mohamed Ali also. It was all yeah. really nice. Now, let me tell you something. Uh, uh, and let me take a small diversion or let me invite your attention to another platform. See, on the 10th of July here in Trivandrum, there was an upsurge in a village called Pundura. See, uh, that is a revolt where really. the people, the local inhabitants revolting against the, um, the governments, the government missionary, I should say. They, uh, that Pundura is a coastal village uh, in Trivandrum, where majority of the population belong to the fisherman community. They go out to the sea to, for their uh, daily bread and uh, say, uh, one day, immediately, one day, all of a sudden, one morning, they blocked all the uh, all, all, all the ambulances coming over there, all the medical staff coming over there, and said, see, we, we want uh, more of consideration. I was just thinking why this happens. See, we were thinking, now we're talking about data journalism, wherein we collect data from reliable sources, as Sriraj put it, uh, reliable sources, and uh, we present, uh, uh, we present uh, uh, our journalistic views in front of people. See, regarding uh, the case of Pundura, that village is really projected before the whole world as a very backward area in which, uh, uh, not, in which uh, uh, the people were not at all doing anything to block the spread of coronavirus over there. They were not doing nothing, nothing to prevent clusters originating there. Then they revolted because, you know, sir, Pundura is the name given to a very big area according to the revenue officials. But the, the local people consider Pundura as a tiny bit of a place surrounded by other places also. And you know, these clusters were developed in places like Maniki Vilagam, Bhima Parli, Valiyatura, uh, and uh, Puttan Pali, uh, Kumar Chanda, all places near this. Uh, uh, this focal point called Pundura. But according to revenue officials, Pundura was the name given to all those places because uh, unfortunately, all these small, small places came under the jurisdiction of the Pundura post office. The postmen <laughs> delivering letters uh, belong to the same post office. So the revenue officials called it all Pundura. And uh, that's why I think that when we, do for, when we go for data journalism, we should have a little bit of homework more done little bit of analysis more done, little bit of consideration more given to the situation. So I would invoke upon all my journalistic friends to go for a three, uh, some three dimensions like uh, information, education, and compassion. Compassion, really. Our basic uh, uh, mission is to impart information, uh, to give, uh, to spread and disseminate information collected from all sources, and to impart education. Even though quoted in sugar, even though given a sugar coating of uh, um, a little bit of uh, entertainment, education imparts. So disseminating information, then imparting education, and with a view or mindset of compassion, doing a little bit of homework and doing a little bit of uh, analysis based on compassion. 
So that's all I am. I wanted to say, sir. <laughs> because because this is okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your great friends, and now he is with. Uh, he was with All India Radio till recently. Uh, last month he has retired from service. And uh, now I will. And uh, this will be the last take. I will call upon uh, Srijan because you now he has to give his opinion on Radha Krishnan's presentation. No, sir. I hundred percent agree with what uh-huh. Mr. Krishnan has said. So uh, now, if if I, if you look at our courage also, what we have done is that uh, we have done a multiple stories on Pudura and uh, focus was on the locals there. So even being a hotspot and uh, containment zone, the moment there was an issue, we send our teams there. People took the risk; they were wearing mask and all and all, but they went there. They spoke to people, and in one of the reports, we have detailed what actually happened. on that day what that led to this confusion on dialysis patient was not given permission to go to hospital there was on small kid uh, which was breastfeeded but the mother doesn't have milk or something so some, they want to go to go out and buy milk so the police didn't uh, use them so so all those minor details we were picked up and regarding this geographical classification so what we normally followed was to depend on the health community so the officials uh, named it as pundula trust so for clarity we also followed that we were even before naming this cluster if you look at the newspaper reports before that uh, th- that was classified as pundula cluster everybody was telling the index patient is from kumari chanda kumari chanda was the hot spot the first merchant became the positive from there so we were all telling about kumari chanda and manike vilagam so suddenly one day the officials decided and named it as puntura cluster so we have to follow that that is what happened we knew that it is different from puntura but uh, for for confirming with the official records we have to follow that pattern that is what happened there okay anyway anyway uh, anyway we have uh, crossed the limits <laughs> the time <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay and i really really i'm i have really really enjoyed it i would like to thank venita nayar gidanjali kurian srijan balakshan for leading the discussions and all those people who have responded and now i call upon father sobhi kanaril sobhi kanaril father can you hear me yes yes i am here sir okay So we are winding up on uh, one of our faculty members. We are saying yes. a lot of thanks. Vishnu sir, Vishnu sir. Vishnu. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, it's oh. been a while since uh, the department has been planning to host an uh, host an international seminar, but uh, with the pandemic hitting us out of nowhere, uh, even uh, it became nearly impossible. so this so we decided to use the uh, positives we have even though it's, it is a very less number so uh, i'm really glad that uh, we could uh, uh, pull off this international webinar successfully so uh, the responsibility was set upon me is to uh, deliver the word of thanks uh, i would like to begin with uh, the two strong pillars of narin college actually our principal and manager uh, reverend dr roy abraham p and reverend father james cordmala who uh, gave uh, great support from the beginning of the planning of the webinar itself and i would like to extend my gratitude to all the three speakers uh, ms vinitha nair uh, ms uh, gidanjali kurian and ms uh, vi srijan thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you sir uh, it's it's i think it's past two at uh, us now uh, i am uh, it's really overwhelming <laughs> it's really overwhelming for the uh, time you have spent for us uh, the sacrifice you took for us thank you so much thank you uh, uh, thank you so much uh, and now i would like to extend my gratitude to uh, M- uh, professor m vijay kumar our director he has been uh, he has been uh, instrumental in the organizing of this webinar and uh, i would also like to thank uh, father sobhi kanalil uh, who did all the technical works for this webinar 
which went really smooth for the last two and a half hours. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Michael Putantara, uh, who has given all the support for this webinar, uh, being the senior member of uh, our faculty. And I would also like to thank my colleagues, uh, Mr. Joby NJ, uh, Ashwin Gavi Namudri, and uh, Elsina, ma'am, uh, for all the works they have done in the organizing of the seminar. Uh, I thank my students uh, and friends who gave all the support for this webinar. And I would like to extend my gratitude to uh, the faculty members and students from other departments of Marian College. And uh, I would like to thank especially uh, Lakshmi ma'am, Mohammed Ali sir, and Radha Gushan sir, and other people who to, uh, actively participated in the webinar and uh, for their valuable comments also. And I thank all the participants who spent the last two and a half hours with us. Uh, I hope you all had a wonderful session with us. And uh, I hope we come out of this pandemic as soon as possible and we'll all go back to our normal lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would also like to raise on record you. The two fantastic ladies, <laughs> I would say, because no, uh, they have patience. They have patience to stay with us for a longer time. Uh, I place on record my appreciation of Father Sobi's service. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir. Over to Sobi, Sobi, close it. Yes, sir. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much from the part uh, from the part of the management. I extend my heartfelt thanks. Uh, thank you so much for participating and giving the good message to the participants. So thank you so much to everyone, each and everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. okay, okay, okay. Meet you, meet you again. You. Meet you again. Thank you. So, thank you. Sir. Thank, you. All. thank you, sir. Thank you, Vinita. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay Kumar, sir, Angie. Oh, thank, thank you, sir. sir. Thank you, Vinny. Thank okay. you, Srijan. And I also thank you so, to Sobi, uh, uh, Father Sobi, and uh, Ashwin, and Vishnu, and uh, Elsina. Uh, yeah, Vishnu, Elsina, Ashwin, um, Casey, uh, sir. You know, both of you, both of you are invited to Kutti Kanam. Both of you are invited to Kutti Kanam. All right. Yeah, when we overcome this problem, we do hope to meet you in person. Yes. <laughs> come out of this digital phase and, you know. <laughs> At that time, there were 203 participants. Uh, then They were here. And uh, ah. there were some people watching in uh, YouTube also. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Very and, much. Uh, you know, we are looking forward to more such uh, webinars from Marian Kutikanam, okay? So thank, thank you, you very much, thank everyone. You, thank you so much for your feedback. Really appreciate it. Really much. appreciate it. Yeah. Anjana and uh, Vini were really uh, well done. Anjana. And uh, Srijan also. And uh, our moderators are also. Thank you very much. And you had a big audience listening to you and watching you. So it was wonderful. Thank you very much. Everyone. Thank you. I also thank our dear Samson sir and my uh, dear teacher. Thanks, sir, and everyone who so participated. Thank thanks you. Thanks, all experts. <laughs> my thanks to Samson, sir. Okay. And uh, my thanks to Toby also. Shall I, shall I stop it now, sir? Okay. okay. okay all right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Vinny. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Radha Krishna, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you. See you. See you. See you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.